Hey, what's up? Like, totally time for 90210. Well, hello everyone. Welcome <laughs> back to the 90210 show. My name is Mark. With me as always is my last Carol. How you doing, Dickie Carol? Hey, what's up? How much has been a good week here? It is June 24th, 1999. And you may wonder why I'm speaking in an terrible Irish accent. Sorry for all our Irish listeners. Uh, because this episode of 902 and I was called The Leprechaun. This was a St. Patrick's Day episode. We, as as previously stated, we're a little behind. So obviously they're in March. We're in June. Uh, we will catch up, though. Slowly. We're plugging away. Yeah, they, there's going to be another season of 90210. They announced it. Uh, this is going to be the last season of 90210, I guess. So one more season, season 10. It makes sense. 10 seasons enco- encompassing the entirety of the 90s. Thank God it's ending. And it will be over. But before they air their first episodes in September, uh, we will finish with this season in August. So... Starting with season 10, we will be live. We were four seasons behind this yeah. show, and we caught up. I mean, only it took us it took us five seasons to catch up four seasons, but we still caught up we four did seasons. It. We, we did it. I am proud of us. But you know who I'm not proud of, Carol? Oh, Steve Sanders? The writers of 902. <laughs> For this episode, The Leprechaun. Yeah. The Leprechaun episode. Mickey from Seinfeld is in this episode. Yeah. That is where I recognized him. Kramer's from. friend Mickey. Yes. Who was accused of wearing lifts in his shoes. That's what? And on an episode of Seinfeld, uh, he was accused of wearing lifts. The the little person? Mm-hmm. To make him a little taller, yeah. Who cares? <laughs> Other little people. He was trying to impress a a, a little person girl. A little uh. a little girl. I See, saying, saying, you can't say little girl. No, because little person. Little, little person woman. Sure. A little woman. <laughs> One of the little women. Okay. I believe it was Joe. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I remembered one of their names. Good job. Carol loves little women. Yeah, there's Joe and Meg. Mm, oh, Meg, yeah. Meg's the one that dies of consumption or whatever. Uh, is she? Tuberculosis. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a while. We did, we did the movie. She wasn't Claire Danes. I know that. It was the other one. Well, Claire Danes is the one that dies. So, Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Claire Danes is the one that dies. So you're right. <laughs> who was the main one? Joe. Yeah, but what's who plays her? Oh, oh um, Winona Ryder. Yeah. Winona, there's Winona Ryder, Claire Danes. I think Kirsten Dunst was one of them. Yeah, the youngest one. Yeah. And then the oldest one is... I think Kirsten Dunst is Meg. No, I think, I think, I don't know. I think Meg might be the, I don't know. I can't remember which actress played which character. Anyway, this has been, does little, not matter. This has been little women talk. Everyone. Exactly. <laughs> now on to 90210. Right. 90210. Oh my Lord. It's like every episode is worse than the last. It's this was really starting up. This was a pretty bad episode. <laughs> this episode was pretty disappointing. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do you want to start? You want to start with the leprechaun? The leprechaun sure. plots. We'll give this some context. Oh my god! So Steve Sanders is just a asshole caricature. I love that word, and I can't say it. And it's so annoying. I love to use it, but I can't say it. Caricature. Yeah, of uh, like his former self. Yeah. He decides that for their uh, St. Patrick's Day paper, they're going to do a story about a leprechaun, and then pay this person. To, like, just be around town and, you know, wear the fucking leprechaun outfit and stuff? Well, I think that he only has him go to the one place to dress up as the leprechaun. He dresses up as a leprechaun, throws chocolate coins around, and has Janet take pictures with her little Nikon camera. And Janet is just absolutely, like, disturbed by this, does not want to do it. I think it's so weird that, like, the Beverly Beat was this, like, respected paper doing stories about uh, fucking, I don't know, homeless people and uh, migrant workers being exploited in textile mills and shit like that when Brandon was writing for them. And Brandon left, and now it's just a fucking tabloid. Now it's just a joke. 
Well, because Steve is not a journalist, and he apparently couldn't ha- afford to hire a journalist. Mm-hmm. So without Brandon, it's just got to be the level that Steve apparently can pull off, which is this bullshit. Yeah. Fun, though. <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, I don't know, like, why Janet is even still with Steve at this point. Like... She hates everything he does and everything about yeah. him. Yeah. I mean, she's, like, literally embarrassed by him. And her parents were trying to set her up with, like, some doctor dude. Like, right. I feel like that would have been a better match for her. And she got ostracized by her family and kicked out by her dad. Where is she living? Isn't she living with Steve? I, I guess. I don't know. We haven't established anything. Huh. Yeah, I assume that, yeah, even though she doesn't really like him... She apparently likes his dick, and that's good enough. So she's just given up her whole life, and now her life revolves around him. They must live together. They work together, and she's embarrassed by him. Yeah. It's really healthy. It's, they're modeling our relationship. No, oh. gosh. You're silly. <laughs> um, but so they're at the paper. And they, well, so they, they put in the paper, they're like, oh, yeah. they're like, uh, hey, if you catch this leprechaun, it's you get a pot of gold because it's, fucking irish day or whatever but like i mean that's just leprechaun lore everybody knows that like if you catch a leprechaun you get a pot of gold that's that's the lore obviously normal people understand that if you catch a leprechaun (laughs) they're not going to give you a pot of gold right or you know perhaps that leprechauns don't actually exist whatever so yeah they're at the paper and this dude comes in and he's like i found this fucking guy (laughs) <laughs> Give me my pot of gold. And Steve's like, what? <laughs> and Mickey's like, I don't know his name, but I'm just going to call him Mickey. Because I don't think they even give him a name. Mickey's like, uh, yeah, I was at the supermarket and this guy was a, the butcher. Yeah, he was asking about meat. <laughs> then all of a sudden he just kidnapped and then he accosted <laughs> me and brought me here for his pot of gold. And Steve's like, there isn't a pot of gold. It's a lie, you know, like in a tabloid. It's so weird. Yeah. So he pulls out a knife. Yeah, his butcher knife. And he's like, I want a fucking pot of gold. Nobody's leaving till I get it. Do, do, you, think he, do you think they just have a pot of gold lying around? Yeah, like guy's nuts. So he's, Steve's like, what the fuck is your problem, dude? And he's like, my son is dying. My son needs a heart operation. He's dying. I want a pot of gold. No, I don't understand why I have to give the crazy person, like, a good reason for acting crazy. Seriously, just make him a nutcase. Right. No, I mean, no matter what his reason, this is not an excusable action. No, like, yeah, I understand that you would get desperate if your child was in desperate need of an operation that you couldn't afford. By the way, like, you can't just say... I. Maybe this is too simplistic, but you can't just say to the hospital, oh, I'll perform the life-saving operation on my son and just bill it to me. I'll I'll take care of it, you know, in installments or whatever, right? And then they bill it to you, and then you just declare bankruptcy. Like, like, is that not a thing? Can you not do that? I don't know. I I don't know if, like, they would require some kind of proof that you'd be able to pay for it. I mean, it's probably like $100,000 or something. He said it was like... I, I oh, wait, did he say how much it was? I don't remember how much he said. I think he said it was like 75000 or it was... Some, I don't remember him saying it. I remember wondering the whole time. Oh, okay. Maybe he didn't say it, but it's a very expensive operation, yeah. I guess. And he said the insurance won't cover it because they were like, what about insurance? He's like, it's a pre-existing condition. That is such bullshit. I hate that law. Like, that should not be allowed. It's not really a law. It's a rule, but... Whatever. By the company. That they do. Like, people... I agree. People shouldn't... Like, if you have diabetes, you now have to stay at the job that you had when you got diagnosed with diabetes, or you're never going to get coverage again, because you got to switch insurances? Yeah, it's fucked up. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Yeah, and I don't understand, like, what... like. Was, does this, did this guy move jobs and he was he became a butcher or something like that? Like, because if he was there since his kid was born, then well, like was this kid born with like you know what I mean? I don't know, we weird. don't know the story. We don't know all the details. It's weird, but anyway. So I understand being freaked out, but like you're also an adult with a working brain, <laughs> right? I would assume. I mean, he doesn't seem to be. So Steve. Uh, they they get him out. They're like, get the fuck out of here. You kidnapped a person. Right. Why don't you leave? And Steve writes this uh, this article, this editorial, 
It's this is a very Brandon move. This mm-hmm. is if Brandon was still on the show, this is what Brandon would write. Sure. But all of a sudden they make Steve good enough to write this article. And also at the same time, Mickey was like, Yeah, all he saw me was is a leprechaun because I'm a little person or whatever. And it's like okay, I mean you 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 took the money, like you know. Were you complaining when they cast you as an Ewok or whatever? I mean, like he wasn't in Star Wars. I was gonna say But like you know, like He's uniquely qualified for certain roles in Hollywood. Do you think Mickey would have a job as an actor if he wasn't a little person? I don't know. He did a decent job. I don't think he's that good of an actor, to be honest. What the fuck? I don't think he is. Okay. I don't know why you gotta... He's no Warwick Davis. Like, piss on the little person there. It's not nice. What is your problem? (laughs) Like, what is wrong with you? Seriously. Like, not okay. I'm not. I know I've done a show with him for five years, but I don't know him, guys. Here's the thing. I'm not pissing on little people. I'm not saying all little people or are, are whatever. Or I'm saying this particular guy I don't think is that good of an actor. Okay. I think it's weird. Steve wasn't like, oh, you're a fucking little person. Like, fuck you. Like, he wasn't acting like an asshole. Like, I think this plot line comes out of nowhere where Mickey's like, that's all you saw me as or whatever. And it's like, if you're going to cast a leprechaun, y- you would look for a little person to cast. You wouldn't cast, like, you wouldn't cast a six foot tall person. That's just not, that's not how leprechauns are depicted. Right. So it's weird that he's like, that's all you saw me as. He never said that. Like, it wasn't like Mickey was like, hey, I'm also like a very talented writer. Could I write an article? And he's like, no, fuck you. You're just a little person. Or like Mickey was like, hey, do you need me for anything else like this or that? And he's like, no, fuck you. Like he he didn't do it. Steve never treated him like he was a piece of shit. Right. You know what I mean? Like he hired him for a job as a leprechaun and he answered the ad. And then he's like, this is all you see me as. What are you talking about? It just seemed weird. Like it was a little tacked on thing for no reason to me. Okay. Um. But anyway, so he writes this big article about how this guy needs, this kid needs an operation and insurance companies suck. And he's like, I also didn't see uh, Mickey as anything other than just a little person. And, and you know, I, like uh, I was, I was wrong for being prejudiced against him. And Janet's like, oh, my God, it takes such a hot guy with a big <laughs> penis to admit that he was wrong. And then she, like, makes out with him and shit. And then the next day they come to the thing and they find letters. It's the Miracle on 34th Street right. situation where there's just a pile of letters. Yep. Through the mail slot, pile of letters can barely open the door. And each of them contains money for this guy and his mm-hmm. kid's operation. You know you know the, the all the times that you read a... Uh, a editorial in a paper and decide to send cash to the paper in an envelope. Right, yeah, it happens all the time. It's fucking weird. I wonder how much money they got. Like, some of them contain, like, $100, and some of them contain, like, $20. Yeah, or 50 or whatever. Yeah, there was, like, I don't know, a, a couple, cu- couple hundred. So even if it was 200 and they each had $100 in them, mm-hmm. that would be, like... Oh, she's going to do math, everyone. 20000 Correct. Which is nowhere near Very enough. Very good. For this operation. We don't know. We don't know how much the operation is. But, I mean, you're estim- I estimated 100000 You were saying we five. We're, we're, we're estimating they got about twenty. And maybe it's enough for down payment on the operation. The uh, He also says at the end, because all these things come in, and they're like, then he's at, at the end of the episode, he's at the beach pit, and he's like, oh, my God, my, my son's going to get an operation. I'm drinking. This is great. And he's an alcoholic. It's a subtextual. What? And um, no, no one else but an alcoholic would abduct a little person <laughs> and expect a pot of gold. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, you know, with the money that came in plus uh, the Beverly Beat agreeing to match the donations. Oh yeah, it's enough for the operation. So they, whatever they got, they also matched. That was one day worth of letters. Maybe they got more. Maybe. Um, that's kind of crazy to me, though, because I thought the newspaper barely had any money. Yeah, I, I know. Like, that's why they're doing all this shit. But, no, nah, it's fine. I mean, he is rich. Steve's rich. And it's like, maybe he just got it from his dad. Maybe he was yeah. like, hey, dad. 
That's true. We haven't talked to Rush Sanders in a while. Yeah, when when this initially happened, they were just like, we don't have any money. Sorry. like, And I was like, what the fuck? You're rich. You know yeah. rich people. Help him. Right. And instead of Steve helping him, then the people sent in the letters and Steve helped him. So, like, without that nudge, without that, like, mm-hmm. hey, everybody's giving money thing, he wouldn't have helped him. Right. Kind of fucked. You know what, though? I think, like, I want to go to Beverly Hills now and just write a, an op-ed about, like, oh, we're struggling or whatever. We need money and see how many people. Because apparently the people of Beverly Hills are incredibly generous right? with their with their... There are vast amounts of wealth. Apparently. The writers of 90210. <laughs> so that was our stupid fluff piece yeah. in the midst of all the other stuff that that's, goes on in the show. That's the C story, or I mean the B story if you want to be generous, but that's the little thing mixed in throughout the more serious stuff that goes on in the episode. And that's what they do every week with Steve. Yeah, um, Steve, Steve can only do those storylines apparently according to them. He can't have serious storylines. And then, like, okay, uh, let's talk about Noah. Uh, let's talk about Noah. So we find out that Noah is having trouble paying the rent or the mortgage he's on the got, club. He's got so Noah money. He owns the building. <laughs> I didn't, like, I don't understand the business situation that they have. He's leasing the building. I get, Well, no, I guess, I guess that's true. He owns the building, but he has a mortgage through the bank. Yeah. Uh, so he took out, this is not usually how business space is purchased or bought or anything. You know, in my, in my experience anyway, in my vast experience right. buying commercial real it's estate. It's a property mogul. This is not, uh, this is not how it's usually done. It's usually leased through a company or, or whatever, you know, but yeah, he bought the building and put, you know, mortgaged it through a bank like you would a house. Seems weird, but whatever. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, initially when this all started, okay, Nat was leasing his space. And right. there was a carpet dude next door. Yeah, that's correct. And then Dylan, when that guy was moving out, I thought leased the other space for the After Dark. That's what I thought, too. But I guess he bought the building so that he owns it. And I guess that carpet guy maybe owned the building. Maybe. And he wanted to sell, and, and Nat originally leased it from him, the other side. And uh, now, then Dylan bought the building. Dylan sold the building to Valerie. Right. And then Noah bought it I from... I like he gave it to her. Or no, or no uh, Valerie sold it to David. Yeah. <laughs> and then David... Or, sold it to Noah. Well, Noah bought it from somebody no because there was a company that owned it that's right there was a company that owned it that's what i thought so all these people were leasing but at some point everyone was leasing noah bought the building yeah no because he was like the millionaire and he bought the building he saved to save david he bought the building okay so remember that woman wanted to kick him out or whatever yeah so that's how this happened. Okay, so he owns the building, but mm-hmm. he can't pay, make his mortgage payments. He's three payments behind, according yeah. to the bank, who comes to talk to him in person, which also does not happen. Right, yeah, the banker's just like, hey, let's have a discussion. You know, we're yeah, gonna what's to, going on? We're going to have to foreclose if you can't. Uh, the bank needs some answers. Yeah, and he's like, well, what? A, well, we need a specific timeline as to mm-hmm. when you're going to be able to pay. He's like, well, what if I don't have specifics? He's like, well, then. Yeah. Um, so he gets an offer... From some woman, of course, this happens at the same time. Of course, yeah. Some woman comes in, she's like, hey, you know, I want to... Uh, I, I own a, a hip restaurant in Santa Monica that Donna's been to. Because Donna's like, I love your restaurant. Right. She's like, I want to fucking level the peach pit. and <laughs> Yeah. And put up a restaurant here in Beverly Hills, a, a second franchise. A big fish, too, if you will. And apparently she is willing to pay twice what Nat is paying. Correct. And he's like, mmm, tasty money. So Donna's like, well, of course you can't do that. I mean, that's your friend. And he's like, yeah, right, of course. Wahaha. <laughs> he does say that. Yeah. He does a maniacal laugh. I mean, it's just like Donna's so naive. Like, she has no understanding of money. First of all, 
They keep talking about how Nat and Noah are friends. Nat and Noah are not friends. Yeah. Like, he hasn't been here the whole time. It's not like he was, like, Brandon working for him in high school or some Mm. shit. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's been here for a few years. They've been business partners. I don't think they hang out. I've never seen them talk to each other. Right. Until this episode. So, what the fuck? Um, and he just, and he goes up to Nat later and he's like, so, you know, I need your advice because I've got this friend who he's in business with this other friend and Nat's like, oh, you should never be in business with friends because Nat understands. Yeah, Nat knows he's not friends with no <laughs> Right? <laughs> and he's like, so, you know, he, he got this offer for twice as much and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, he ends up finally getting around to telling Nat that he's talking about him and that he's going to, yeah. you know. Basically buy him out or whatever. He's like, oh, you're fucking me over. He's like, I can't afford to pay twice. He's like, yeah, sorry, Nat. Nat looks so, like, pissed off. And it's like he just finished being like, oh, business is business. Mm-hmm. But then it's you and you're like, fuck yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then Dylan, Dylan a couple times mm-hmm. co- comes around, just, like, shows up in someone else's <laughs> storyline yeah. to be like, hey, do better, and then leaves. Right? <laughs> So he comes up to to Noah and he's like, "Yeah, uh, Nat's a friend. You can't uh, can't fuck him over." And he's like, "There's nothing I can do. They're gonna take my my business." And he's like, "Oh well, you know, figure out figure it out." And he leaves. And then later, Noah's like at the peach pit, and he's like, "Whatever." Nat comes up to him. This is the funniest thing Nat's ever said. I think. Nat comes up to him and he's like, you put me out of business? You have the fucking nerve to try to get to eat here? Like, get the fuck out or whatever. He's so pissed. Mm-hmm. His Italian comes out. <laughs> and um, Dylan's like, look, guys, don't worry about it. Uh, Nat, you're staying. I canceled your deal, Noah. He's like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? You can't cancel my deal. He's like, yeah, I own the building. I went and bought it from uh, the bank. So now I own the building. And... Uh, here, here's how it's going to go. Noah, you run your business. Nat, you run your business. And I'll make all the hard decisions. I'll be in the middle. Now, I'm sorry, but this is not how life works. Right. He was three payments behind on his mortgage. That mm-hmm. does not mean somebody can go to the mortgage company and be like, hey, I'm going to buy it. Well, technically, you can. So, like, that happens a lot, actually. He didn't buy the building he bought the mortgage so um i mean i think they i think they want us to think that he i think they want to set it up like oh now dylan owns the building or whatever so like yay for him but that's not actually the case like he bought he bought the debt from the bank like noah took out a loan he owes the bank this amount of money for the building right Mm -hmm. um it's the same. I don't know if an individual person can do this. You might be right. I don't know if this is ac- actually how it works. But like, if you take out a mortgage for a house, they that the the company that that does the mortgage for you that gives you the the funds to buy the house that gives you the loan and then owe, owes your owns your debt, they can sell it to other mortgage companies. It happens all the time. Like other mortgage companies will buy it then. And then you start your you're making payments to a different bank, a, okay. diff, a different mortgage company. So that's essentially what they're saying he did. He went to the bank and said, "Hey, that mortgage, the debt, I'm going to give you the remainder of what he owes you to buy that debt." And that way, the reason they do that is so, like the companies do that, is so that they can collect interest on it or whatever. And since he's three payments behind, the bank's probably like. Yeah, we we were afraid we were going to have to foreclose. You're offering us the full amount of money that we're left owed. Yeah, we'll we'll take it. And then okay. uh, so that's that's what they're saying. So technically, Noah still owns the building. Uh, Dylan owns his debt, so he has to pay to 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 Dylan. So he really has nothing to do with Nat. No, the whole building is is um is what is owed in the mortgage. So he owns Nat's side of the building too. But that means he can't. That means that uh, Nat will pay lease payments to Dylan, and um, he and he obviously won't kick him out. Okay. So what else was he lurking around about? I don't even remember the other David David's storyline. But anyway, that's the that's the resolution to that. But David's storyline with his girl. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, his, so David had started dating the Russian. I keep saying Russian. No, she's Venezuelan. Correct. <laughs> you know, it doesn't help that she's blonde. You know, those Russian Venezuelans. <laughs> no, 
Da. <laughs> But he started dating the girl from she Venezuela. Keeps, she keeps calling him David. David, yeah. Hello, David. You know, like a Russian would. <laughs> Shut up. Um, and she tells him that she has to go, that her visa is up or whatever, and it's time for her to leave. So, like, they're not. she doesn't want to have sex with him because she's leaving. Yeah, exactly. Like, basically, he's like, hey, let's have sex. She's like, mm, no, I got to go. And David wants to have sex so bad that he's <laughs> like, oh, my God, how do I get her to say? Yeah, you got to stay. <laughs> let's figure this out. Right. Um, so he's like, she's like, well, I have to have a job that I'm uniquely qualified for. Correct. Um, and he's I'm like, never going to. I got gonna a job f- for you, baby, that only you can do. And I'm never going to find a job like that. Her whole work experience he- is cleaning at the after dark mm-hmm. and one job doing makeup for a movie yeah where she did there was like a zombie movie or something like that so there he's like i i know a director let me let me producer hook you up. But producer yeah. whatever so he gets her like an interview with this producer and in the amount of time it takes for him to like walk her over there mm-hmm. the job's gone yeah, he's like oh sorry job's gone what the fuck? Like, what the fuck and and he goes yeah the daughter of the owner of the production company got the job there's nothing i can do and he's like okay so that storyline is nothing like that that development means nothing it was it was so dumb it was dumb to even put it in there if that's all you were going to do with it i mean i like like i said to you at the time i think that this is more them showing he's exploring every avenue i guess but like it should be more than just like one scene it was two scenes it was hey i've got this job for you let's go get it and it was uh no job's not here okay well and then there's the, been more than that and then there's dylan in the background going hey david if you love her figure it out yeah do better david it's weird yeah, it is. It's like, why is he... He's he's lurking around in the background of everything. Yeah. But they go to the after dark. They're dancing. They're talking about how sad it is that mm-hmm. she's leaving. And he's like, I'd do anything to keep you here. And she's like, you would? Yeah. Why don't you marry me then? I hate that. He should have been the one to offer to marry her, not for her to ask him to marry her. I don't even think he thought of it. But he was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'll marry you. So uh, they're going to get married for a visa. They've been on like three dates. One of them was taking her to look for jobs, but sure. <laughs> to get married. Because like, they're like, oh, soulmates or whatever. It's so ridiculous. Stupid. They didn't even, stupid. Go, they didn't even go to uh, to Dylan Psychic to see if they were <laughs> psychic right. throughout the years. <laughs> throughout all of in reincarnations. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like her character, but this is not a smart Dave What's decision. Her, what is her character? Her character says David. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know what, what character she is. Yeah, I guess that's true. I we'll mean, see. she seems fine, but, like, I don't know her. Yeah. And neither does David, but he really, really wants to have sex with her. So. Yeah. So. You know what's funny is, like, when she was hesitant about having sex, I, I thought she was going to be like, I'm a virgin. Right. I'm waiting till I get married. <laughs> and it would be a whole Donna thing again. Yeah, he's like, know. oh, my God, this again. <laughs> but that's... Their storyline, so I guess they'll get married next episode. Who the fuck knows? I mean, they'll have to do it quick, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, And then what do we have left? We have... Gina and Donna. Gina and Donna and Kelly. Oh, Kelly and Matt. Oh, my. Kelly and Matt, I don't like like the storyline. I don't like Kelly. I haven't liked Kelly in years. Oh, yeah. There's there's a... There's a... Yeah. I, I haven't either. There's a small Kelly and Matt, like, side plot... I don't know what you want to do first. The Kelly and Matt side plot with the prenuptial agreement or the whole main story of the show. I guess let's just talk about the prenuptial agreement real fast here because it won't take long. I think I really feel like one of the writers, whoever wrote this episode, was like uh, somebody asked them to sign a prenup and they were like, this is bullshit. I don't want to sign a prenup. Yeah, it... (laughs) This, this is so stupid. Matt is a lawyer. One of his jobs as a lawyer mm-hmm. is to write a prenuptial agreement for people. If they if they ask him and offer to pay him, mm-hmm. what is the fucking problem? Like, why is he so involved? You know why? Because he's with Kelly. And Kelly right. is a self-righteous, judgmental bitch. Yes. And she's like bleeding herself into him every yeah. time they have sex. <laughs> well, they apparently haven't had sex yet. Yeah, that's true. Because just any time she touches his skin, I guess. She's like a symbiote. <laughs> but no, he... Yeah, exactly. Like That's like doing estate planning or something like that. If, if you're... By the way, these are all... These are all specialties in law. 
and he apparently just does everything. Yeah. He's a criminal lawyer that also does prenuptial agreements, which is a family law matter. Uh, he also represents business interests because he's working with the Beverly Beat, which is business law. What the fuck kind of law are you practicing, dude? You can't. Yeah. You can't do this. You, <laughs> as a lawyer, you can't just practice every kind of law. In the tenth season, he's going to be arguing something in front of the Supreme Court <laughs> because he's a constitutional lawyer too, apparently. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. The whole thing is fucking dumb. But he's very upset about this prenuptial agreement. Because real quick, because I, I, I'm not done with this rant. This is like if they wrote a doctor character and the doc- and the doctor character is like, hey, I'm in surgery this week or whatever. Uh, now I'm uh, going to treat this foot infection. Oh, now I've got to do a colonoscopy. Oh, uh, now I've got to give birth to this baby. Like if it was, you know, every week he did something like that. That's right. not how lo- the law works. That's not how being a doctor works. Exactly. So go ahead. Uh, Prenuptial agreements. This couple oh. comes in and they're like, "We're stockbrokers. We we love money. We we love we love hedging our bets. We like other stock words. We're going to use." But they're all like, "Oh, we're so in love and like so happy together." Mm-hmm. And they're like, "But we protect against the like uh, yeah worst uh, case worst. scenario inevitability uh, market downfall bears bulls." We're using stock terms, right? So they're like, "So we need a prenup." And Matt's like, are, are you sure you really need that? And they're like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then he's complaining to Kelly about it. And she's like, oh, my gosh, you shouldn't do that. Prenuptial awful. agreement. Oh, no. no, it's the worst thing in the world. That's why I think this is this is a very personal thing that mm-hmm. this writer, writer wrote. So Nat or Nat, God, Matt ends up just telling these people he's not going to do it. Nope. Sorry. Your money's no good here. Yeah. Like he is struggling for money. Uh huh. Which makes no sense if he can perform all these different kinds of law he's services. Livering, he's living with. He's living. He's <laughs> he's living with three other guys, right? In a house that none of them own. But he's just like I. I would recommend that you just you know take a chance on each other. But yeah. I'm not going to do this. Bye bye. Yeah. No. No. No net. No safety net. Be like Papa Walenda. Which is terrible advice. Yeah. I mean, if they feel like they need it, then they need it. Because they're probably going to get divorced. Because, like, most people get divorced. Mm -hmm. What the fuck, man? It's a nice thing to hear from your wife. But, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, We're not going to, though. Oh, I know. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's their storyline. It was stupid. It's just a fill. It's a filler. Honestly, like, it it had nothing to do with anything. Well, that's why I said it seems, it comes out of nowhere. It doesn't have to do with with the overall plot of the the episode. It doesn't really give us more, like, in-depth character stuff Mm -hmm. this feels very personal yeah this feels very personal for this particular writer somebody asked them to sign a prenuptial agreement and they had very strong feelings about it although in the background of all this um him and kelly are hanging out and she wants to have sex and he's not ready yeah he's like oh i don't know yet and and at the end of the episode she's like you know what you better fucking get ready because uh mama needs some (laughs) sex Some sugar, you know. And he's just like, okay, no safety net. Let's go. I hope that doesn't mean they're not going to use a condom. Oh, my God. God, can you imagine if they have a baby? Ugh. She should not breed. (laughs) Evil incarnate. No more Kellys around. No. Although she's technically not supposed to be able to get pregnant or supposed to have a hard time anyway. Yeah, that's good. Uh, So the main story of the episode is uh, it's Donna and Kelly, really, and their business but it's Gina being the uh, the Iago, like <laughs> going back and forth between the two of them. They had Tiffany Amber Thiessen's Valerie character do this thing too, mm-hmm. um, a little bit more subtly than, yeah. than she's doing. But like real people that want to manipulate people don't do it exactly like this. Sure, this is really weird because this could easily blow up in your face if the two parties that you're talking to just talk to each other. Like, hey, Valerie said this. Wait, wait, Valerie told me this. Something completely contradictory. It seems like maybe she's just trying to get us to fight. Right. Now for my, no reason. My question, though, is, is is this just her continuing to try to blow up Donna's life? I mean, is it because Donna's involved? Like, why is she even doing this? I, I think she just likes to sow chaos. And, I mean, like, okay, so let's back it up. Like, what the problem is here? Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Is Kelly wants to get PR involved in like promoting the store because Kelly's supposed to be handling the business aspect. Apparently, they're business partners. I don't remember this happening, but 
Donna is the one who makes the clothes. Kelly is the one who's in charge of the business. So Donna does not want to do PR. Apparently she wants her clothes to just speak for themselves, stand on their own. People should buy them because they like them and that's it. That's a really poor business plan, Donna. Yeah. I mean, if your clothes speak for themselves, they would say like, I was sold by a former drug addict. <laughs> um, so Kelly sets up a meeting without Donna's permission. She's like, you set up a meeting without running it by me? And mm-hmm. she's like, I thought we were partners. All right. She doesn't like the PR lady. She, she doesn't want to do it. The PR lady, she, Donna or Kelly wants to get them in the top 10 lists, mm-hmm. you know, like top 10 restaurants, top 10, whatever. Boutique. Yeah. So they, she wants to get in the top 10 list. And this PR person apparently is the queen of being able to do that. So Gina, does she work there? No, she has her own business. She was. She was working there. Now I think she does. She has clients. She does. She lives with them. She does personal training and she lives with them. She was working at the store at first, and now I think she just does the personal training. So she's around, and I mean, she just smells conflict like a bloodhound, and she's Mm -hmm. like, oh, let me get involved. Yeah. So Kelly meets with this PR lady again, even though Donna says she doesn't want her to. Mm -hmm. And Gina's sitting there with her on the couch being involved in this meeting, and I'm like, why is she here? Yeah, and and Gina's like says to, to Kelly, she's like, you know what? Like, it doesn't seem like she really fucking cares what you think. You know? She doesn't respect you. All she wants you to do is uh, is fold shirts. That's your contribution to the business or whatever. And so then Donna, like, uh, Kelly brings that up. And she's like, you know, I, I wanted an opportunity to do more than just fold shirts. Mm-hmm. And she's like, what are you talking about? And um, then after she leaves, Gina goes up to Donna and she's like, seems like uh, she doesn't really have faith in your designs. She, she, you know, she wants to do this or that or whatever. Like, she doesn't respect you or whatever. And so it causes conflict. Yeah. But uh, they get into this argument where she's like, hey, um, Donna, Kelly goes, did you think about the PR person? She's like, yeah, I thought about it. You know, I really don't want to do it. And I know you don't agree, but I don't want to do it. And she was like, well... You're supposed to be in charge of the fashion stuff, the, the all the designs and everything. I'm in charge of the business end of it, and PR is the business end of it. So I want to do it, so we're going to do it. And so they kind of get into a fight. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, they have that meeting with the PR person, and Gina's all there, and she's like, mm-hmm. Gina's like, just lie to her, Kelly. Don't don't even tell her about it. Just well, lie. yeah. Lie because oh, because, yeah, go ahead. The, the, the PR person's big idea is we're going to have a relaunch, a re-grand opening of your thing. We're going to have the press there. We're going to have celebrities there. And I don't remember what the three, the three jewels of PR. And it was like celebrities, press and something like trends or, or heat or some weird industry term. It was a nebulous, just idea. Right. So they pay them. They pay these people to be there and they, they don't they, tell Donna. Yeah. Cause they, like Kelly's like, how are we going to get celebrities to show up? And she's like, we pay them, pay them money. Yeah. So celebrities love money. Donna's at this party and she's so happy. And she's like, oh my gosh, look at all these people that are here. This is amazing. They're here because they thing. love your designs. Yeah. They keep blowing smoke up her ass about that. And then Gina's like, no, 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 no. She's like, oh, are you really comfortable with this though? And she's like, what? They're here because they love my design. She's like, yeah, but I mean like Kelly's money too. Cause they, she paid them, you know, she paid them to be here. Right. And she's like, what? Yeah. And so then they get in a fight and kick everybody out. Yep. Which, like, I'm sorry, they act like this works in their favor and, oh, everybody's talking about you now. Uh-huh. These were people who were paid to be there, didn't even care about the clothes in the first place. Right. And now it's like, oh, no, this uh, drama sells. The fact that you had a fight about the fact that you paid people to be there, that's going to sell? No. Yeah, it's really weird. But the PR person comes and she's like, it's a fucking hit because you want you, you fought and everyone's talking. And they Everyone wants to go here or whatever. And, you know, you'll be in top ten for sure. And... This is where they resolve their fight or whatever. Because yeah. Donna, Donna's like, it's not real, though. It's a fraud. And she's like, it's PR. Who cares? <laughs> and it's like, I feel the same way. I mean, maybe I'm a bad person. But it's like, uh, does it really matter? Like, in, at the, in the end of the day, what, what is it that you want to accomplish, Donna? You want to design what you think are elegant, great-looking dresses for people to wear. You want people to buy them and appreciate them and then, like, be seen in them, right? That's what you want. So does it matter if the reason that the eyes go to your stuff 
is a fraud? Like, isn't that all marketing is? Yeah. Like, if, like, for books, like, I, I, like if, I have, if I've ever published any books, right, and I get people to come see them because I, like, I don't gin up some controversy or something like that, right? But then they read my book and they like my book and they're like, oh, I like this book. I like the writing. I like the ideas. Does it matter why they got there? No. Like, what brought them to the book? It just matters that you have, you get the the thing you want, right? Right. But, yeah, Donna, of course, is just like, oh, no, it's all so sad. And Kelly's like, you know what, PR lady, get the fuck out of here. Donna and I are best friends, and we're choosing friendship over this. But, like, whatever was gained from the PR lady already happened. So. You would think so, yes. Whatever. Whatever. It's ridiculous and dumb. The whole episode was ridiculous and dumb. I didn't enjoy very much about this episode. I'm really, really disappointed in them. Yeah. They're coming towards the end of the season. And the end of their creativity. Yeah. I, I'm interested to see what they do with this last season. Where, where they where they know that they, they're wrapping things up. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Maybe they'll be more focused. I hope it, so. Like, this show seems like it lasted maybe three seasons too much. Yeah. Because it's very wheel spinning now. They're just... They're just spinning their wheels. They're just recycling ideas and stuff. Like the whole thing with Noah, like being uh, behind in payments and stuff like that and like struggling or whatever. That was David's storyline. Yeah. Like they're just recycling ideas. Agreed. Yeah. They probably should have uh, wrapped when Brandon left, but whatever. So that is the episode. Carol, tell people where they can buy mortgages from. <laughs> you can write us at latefee1994 at AOL.com. Mm-hmm. Check out our website at www.retrolatefee.com. Yep. And share the tapes with your friends. Oh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.